Go ahead and start here. And uh, just double checking that the park's on. Joe, thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. Right. Well, uh, once again, a uh, oh, great pleasure to be introducing our bar shop seminar speaker. Uh, this week we have uh, Zhang Men Zhu, uh, known as Jack but to most people. And I want to say uh, straight up, thanks for the, uh, doing this uh, seminar because it was at very short notice, uh, less than a couple of days I think we gave him. We had one of our speakers pull out. So it's a great pleasure to have Jack uh, come and present. Uh, uh, those who know Jack know that he's an assistant professor here in the Department of Microbiology at Utusca. Uh, he joined the department in 2013 and that was after doing his, uh, I guess, uh, basic science degree in China. Uh, University of Science and Technology in Hefe, I think that's how I pronounce it. Something like that. Um, sorry for my mispronunciation there. And then also uh, did a, uh, his doctoral studies uh, at USC. Uh, then moved uh, around pretty much in all the top schools over in California. Uh, Caltech, uh, postdoc there, postdoc also at um, uh, University of California in Irvine. I think he was made a the equivalent of an assistant professor or something close to it there and then then was recruited over here to the department. Uh, Jack's known for his work on uh, uh, B-cell heavy chain uh, uh, switching and uh, and I think he's done I mean, as we're going to see some incredibly interesting work on the mechanics of actually how the heavy chain switches isotype once it's once the B-cell is stimulated. Uh, the implications for aging are that the process uh, sometimes goes awry and uh, I think it's becoming more clear now, uh, certainly it's well known anyway and we're going to hear more about this as well, I was just talking to Jack before, that with age we, we see an expansion of a subset of B cells uh, and in fact uh, uh, to the point where they been, can become uh, one one subtype or one one particular one clone can become uh, the predominant uh, B cell species present in 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 the body. So on that note, um, and I, I also just want to say also that uh, Jack's work also has direct uh, relevance to autoimmunity and perhaps even cancer. Uh, we now know that when when the process that's used to switch isotypes. Uh, goes goes wrong, it can actually start cleaving all over the uh, the genome. So on that note, uh, welcome and thanks again. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, thanks John for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to present your work. And uh, this work done, is mostly done in the antibody laboratory. This is a uh, integrated the B-cell lab in our department, uh, jointly run by Dr. Paula Casali, our chairman, Dr. Hong Zhang, who's also in the audience, and myself. And uh, a lot of work, this is over the years, and uh, I will also present some unpublished data. So I'm not distinguishing published versus unpublished, but I'll keep most of you interested. So there will be two parts in the talk. The first part will be uh, uh, the, the main part. In this part, I'll talk about the role of RAP7, which is a small GTPase in signal transduction in B cells. And uh, I try to convince you that uh, uh, this specific role of RAP7 will, should be important for uh, antibody class switching and antibody responses. This, if time allows, I'll present some preliminary data in the second part, particularly relevant to Asian, because we want to present a new vaccine strategy that the centered on T cell independent uh, antibody response. So why do we start study antibody class region? There are five classes in antibodies. There are IgMs, IgD, IgG, IgE, and IgA. Uh, IgM and IgD, they are generated from the uh, same uh, genes and the gene transcription process uh, through uh, different splicing or polyadenination events. But IG generation of IgG, IgG, IgA, uh, this entails the general DNA recombination process, which I will talk about a little later. But why different IgG isotypes? It turns out that uh, uh, 
So the difference in the constant region as encoded by the uh, different constant axon clusters, different IG classes will have different tissue, distribution, tissue distributions and uh, effect functions. For instance, IgMs are many in the bloodstream and uh, they are pentamers. So the big size of this class of antibodies limits their penetration so they could not go into the extravascular space. And uh, IgMs are only good, or mostly good in uh, complement activation. By contrast, IgGs, they can penetrate into extravascular space and the clear viral and the bacterial infections over there. And that they are also good in opsonization and the activation of a different kind of immune cells. So we call class switch antibodies like the elite defenders, just like a Navy SEAL. So how, uh, when do these different classes of antibodies generate? B cells are the resource of all antibodies. And the B cells are developed in the bone marrow initially as the immature B cells. And these, they come out of the bone marrow, go into the periphery, and they mature in the secondary lymphoid organs. And during this process, they secrete a big amount of IgMs. And IgMs are good in a way that uh, they have the polyreactivity, as Dr. Casale has shown a long time ago. These are called the natural auto antibodies. But don't let the terms confuse you. These auto antibodies are actually good. They are important for uh, the initial frontline defense against the infections. And once a B cell matures in the lymphoid organ, they reduce the surface expression of IgMu. Instead, of now they start to express Ig delta, which is equivalent for the uh, IgD antibodies. Only in the periphery, one of mature naive B cell encounters a pathogen, as it activated, and upon activation and uh, receiving additional stimuli, which I will come in a moment, this activated B cells can undergo class switching process. Now they start to express either Ig gamma, which is equivalent for IgG, or Ig epsilon or Ig alpha, which is equivalent to IgE and IgA respectively. And the class switch the B cells then further differentiate into plasma cells. This is um, professional antibody secreting cells. All they do is secrete antibodies at incredibly high rate, almost at 1,000 molecules per second. And the plasma cell can also home back into the bone marrow to uh, become long-lived plasma cells. And the, these cells keep producing antibodies, and uh, that's one of the basis of the serum membrane for humoral response. Alternatively, the class switched B cells can also undergo differentiation to memory B cells. And uh, these cells are just like naive cells, they are small. They, seems to be sil they seem to be silenced, but as soon as they encounter additional antigen, the same pathogen here, they, they immediately differentiate back into plasma cells, thereby producing uh, plasma cells. Memory B cells lifespan is also very long, so they, they are uh, also important for the uh, humoral response memory. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, this is a techn technicality. Uh, what we um, when we talk about uh, secreted form, we call them IgMs, IgG, IgD, and IgA. But when they are on the surface, uh, because these are really not IgGs. They, it's just the gamma heavy chain, which I'll explain later in the following slide. But uh, this is uh, what I call surface equivalent of IgG. And uh, actually, since you mentioned it, uh, it has been shown that uh, if you have the same cells, one express Ig mu on the surface, one express Ig gamma, they have the same antigen binding specificity, but when you 
stimulator with the same antigen, the signal leads through Ig gamma is actually better, possibly because of the longer cytoplasmic chains. CSI is actually a evolutionary conserved process. Uh, first, you can find the CSR in frogs and all the way to humans, and primates, and including humans. And what's interesting about CSR is like seems like a different uh, species. They use uh, different IgG isotypes or IgEs for their defense. For instance, in the rat, I'm sure many of you use rat mono monoclonal antibodies. And it turns out most of the rat MABs are IgG2A isotypes. So, uh, and in the horse, it's unclear whether somatic hypermutation occurs. Somatic hypermutation is another antibody diversification process. Uh, this process makes changes in the antigen binding site, thereby changing the affinity of antibodies. Now, when this is coupled with positive selection, they can start to select very high affinity antibodies. It's unclear whether horses use SHF, but it's very clear horses use CSR. And actually, not only any regular CSR, they use CSR to IgE as a defense mechanism. You can find a thousand-fold or more IgEs in a horse body as compared to humans or wives. So that's, and it's unclear what's the regulation mechanisms. OK. Now, let's come back to what is really uh, immunoglobulin class switch DNA recombination. This is a process that happens in the IGH locus. Uh, again, to answer Dr. Lee's question, uh, if you look at, this is the reason we call it Ig gamma, because it's the axon cluster that's termed the C gamma 1. And the C mu and the C delta encodes for IgM and IgD, respectively. But again, their expression does not entail any recombination process. In order for, let's say in this case, IgA1 to be produced, let's suggest that uh, this part of the chromosome has to be got rid of, eventually leading to this. And the C alpha 1 axon class runs closely juxtaposed to VDJ region then that's why you have IgG1. In order for this recombination process to work, uh, what needed is the AIC, AID, stands for activation induced cytidine deaminase. As we have shown, uh, while I was a postdoc in Dr. Salis lab, what we did is actually identify uh, recurring AGCT repeats in so-called switch region, which is a sort of uh, region five prime upstream of the UHC axon clusters. So we identify this AGCT, AGCT repeats in all switch regions. And the 1433 adapted proteins as the factors that can preferentially target AGCT repeats. Then 1433 brings AID into all these switch regions. After AID media cited in the amination, double strand breaks are generated. And after donor and accept the switch region synapses, uh, this looping out of the process will get rid of this intervening DNA. As Dr. Casale and Dr. Zhang have recently shown that this double strand break resolution depends on Ku in the so-called uh, non-homologous androning pathway. It also depends on 52, which is called the alternative androning pathway. I want to uh, emphasize the three important transcription processes during CSR. Why is the germline transcription? Why is this important? It turns out, as I said, that naive is sort of in you know, quite a silenced state. More so in the IGH locus, it's tightly packed. You do need this transcription process to open up the chromatin in order to let the switch region to be accessible by AID and by 1433. In addition, you also need the histone modifications, which are actually co-occurring with germline transcription in donor and uh, acceptor switch regions only. And that helps the recruitment of the factors as well. And the second transcription process is called the circle transcription. This is primary, uh, this exclusively occurs in the switch circle. And as you can imagine, this is the 
This circle only exists when CSI is occurring. So we use this circle transcripts as the molecular index of ongoing CSR. Then finally, we have post-recombination transcription. This is the index of the completed CSR. Now, uh, come back to the question, what induces a CSR, right? And uh, most of the CSR event in bodies is T cell dependent, because when you have uh, antigen stimulation, the first thing uh, is dendritic cells, as well as B cells, they take up antigen process them, and they're presented to T cells. Then, uh, what T cells do is to upregulate their CD40 ligand expression also called CD154. While well, a colony the B cell and the T cell interacts, this CD40 ligand engages CD40 that is constitutively expressed on B cell surface. This triggers a, a signaling cascade. The first thing that is, uh, that is um, happening is the recruitment of trap 6. This is signal adapters. It, it is also a E3 ubiquitin ligase. What it does is to catalyze the generation of K63 free poly ubiquitin chain, or such a chain that is conjugated to trap 6 itself. Upon this poly ubiquitination, uh, IKK gamma is activated, uh, is recruited and activated, leading to the if eventually IK I B phosphorylation degradation and uh, and kappa B activation. And uh, this is important for the gene, in, gene induction that activate B cells. At this point, from a highly silenced naive B cells, now you have activated B cells. In naive B cells, you, virtually there's no cytoplasmic content. All you have is a big nucleus. But once activated, the cell volume increase with the diameter change by uh, at least doubled. And the entire transcriptome also increases uh, by a fold. But this activation is insufficient for the differentiation process. In order for this to occur, you also need additional m kappa b signaling. Then we ask ourselves, is this surface signaling of CD40 sufficient for this process? Certainly, it's sufficient for the activation. But is this sufficient for differentiation as well? So actually, we hypothesize that uh, it is not. Instead, what is needed is the internalization of the surface receptors into endosomal pathways. And only in the mature endosomes, uh, when you have REP7, this can further stabilize the interaction of CD40 and uh, TRAP6 for sustained nf B activation, which we call nf B 2.0. So how do, we, how do we prove this? The first thing we did is to um, treat the stimulated B cells with dinosaur. This blocks the endocytosis of the receptors through clathrin-dependent pathway. And as you can appreciate here, the treatment does not affect the B cell proliferation. Uh, this is after 96 hours of stimulation, which is needed for the full differentiation process to complete. By contrast, for activation, you only need 24 hours. And uh, this is CFSC dilution assay. For cells that has not divided, you will have the highest amount of CFSC. But once a B cell divides once, the CFSC halves. That's why you have this progressive loss of CFSC when cells divide. So treatment of dinosaur does not affect the a division of cells, but what it affects is the uh, blocking of class switching to IgG1. Hang on, so, uh, so what was the assay? Oh, can you say, run, run me through it again? This is called a CFSE linked class switching assay. I'm sorry, what is it? CFSE, this is a dye that can label amine group of almost all proteins inside the cell. Once a cell is labeled, then you will have, this is a, uh, this can be analyzed by flow cytometry. It occupies the same channel as the physics, yeah. right? And the while a cell is labeled, as shown here, right, if it doesn't divide, it will remain to be CFSC high. But once this cell divides once, then it separates 
CFSC into equally to two daughter cells, then you have the half of the CFSC. Then as the cell keeps dividing, then you have less and less CFSC. So this is one of the convenient ways to track cell division. Right? So we can show here the, divi uh, the number of divisions in dinosaur treated B cells really is comparable in non treated B cells. So suggesting cell division is not affected, if at all, uh, uh, if uh, maybe marginally. But uh, uh, what we can also analyze is the IgG1 class switching shown by the quantum here from 30% to 35% to 11%. Uh, we can ignore this because uh, this is more about this uh, dependent, uh, this independent class switching. So uh, we can block uh, CD40 endocytosis. Can we knock out the rep 7 and uh, to address the role of rep 7 in class switching? So to do this, we use uh, rep 7 flux allele. The CRE is a little bit um, um, unique in that. The CRE is locked in after the C gamma 1 exon cluster. So in two chromosome alleles, one can be used for class switching, but the other one can be induced by uh, CD40 ligand plus cytokine O4 to induce this streamline transcription with CRE. And after CRE is expressed, then it can flux out uh, the first ex coding axon of rep 7 to generate a heterozygote, which we named code by code, wild type, or knockout. Uh, the beauty of this system is that uh, uh, cytokine alpha is important for the uh, production of Cree, and the one alpha is present, only uh, other uh, locus will not be changed, right? So in order for, for instance, CSR2 happen for C gamma 2 b or C gamma 2 a you need other cytokines. Alpha is not needed. But once you have other cytokines, this CRE will not be generated. So then you can imagine only one B cell is about to undergo in switching to IgG1, will rep 7 becomes knockout. So I'll come back to that later, because this is a very important point. So once we do this, after 48 hours, we can delete 97% of uh, rep 7 from the genome, and this results in the uh, virtual abrogation of um, rep 7 expression. And again, to emphasize this is inducible uh, knockout, in cells that is not treated, is not stimulated with CD154 plus R4, you have normal rep 7 expression. And the disrupt seven knockout leads to uh, reduced uh, phosphorylation of the P65 subunit of uh, m gamma b uh, thereby uh, reduced AID expression. By contrast, the activation of the non-canonical m gamma b pathway shown by precursor P100 and the product P52 does not seem to be affected. Neither uh, was affected is the MAP kinase pathway of uh, P38 and the ERK. ERK is particularly important because uh, it is important for the generation or for the expression of BLIMP1, which is a master transcription factor for plasma cell differentiation. So you can see REP7 really plays a very specific role in signal transduction and uh, uh, gene expression. So REP7 in the enzyme. Yeah. Uh, it's a late mature endosome. It's not you know, recycle, recycling endosome. As far as I remember, uh, all those reps, the one that are most important for recycling is rep 11 and rep 9. Yeah. yeah. Say it again, this is mouse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so reduced AID expression uh, immediately translates into reduced cost switching. Again, this is a CFSC dilution assay, uh, the way we track cell divisions. And then we also do survival analysis to make sure that the, at the dosage we use, uh, sorry, not that, uh, in a knockout, the survival is also uh, normal. Uh, 
As I explained, uh, only in B cells that are undergoing cell IgG1 sh should have a knockout of rep 7 right? How about other Ig isotypes, including IgA? For this, what we did is to stimulate uh, B cells with CD154 plus alpha for 48 hours. If you remember, at this point, 97% of the rep 7 is gone. Then we wash away this, and then we stimulate the cells with this combination of the stimuli for IgA induction. And because AID is already, uh, AID expression is already low, then we can see the switch into IgA is also lower, further confirming that uh, although REP7 knockout is context dependent of different IgA isotypes, the central CSR machinery, uh, for example, AID, uh, is impaired. And actually, we can rescue some of the CSR with enforced uh, expression of AID. So how about in vivo? Uh, in uh, rep 7 conditional knockout mice, uh, we can see uh, eight, more than 80% of reduction of IgG1 already. Again, uh, other IgG isotypes or IgA are normal. So this further validate our design, meaning we only specifically abrogate CSR in uh, cells that are about to undergo switch to IgG1. And we can also inject a T-cell dependent antigen, which is a hepton conjugated to chicken gamma globally and analyze high affinity uh, hepton binding antibodies. And uh, IgG1 is reduced, but not the other Ig isotypes. And uh, this reduction uh, is associated with reduced uh, antibody forming cells. Um, I mentioned the somatic eye mutation and the class vision occurs in the secondary lymphoid organs, but actually more specifically in these organized microstructures called the germinal centers. Germinal center B cells, uh, they express a lactin that actually combined peanut agglutinin. So once we use fluorescence label the PNA, we can actually label germinal center B cells. And using this assay, we show that the germinal center formation and the germinal center visa development uh, is not affected by the knockout. Uh, the proliferation of um, knockout B cells shown by the BRDU incorporation, the intracellular staining, uh, is also normal. What is affected is the class switching within the germinal center B cells drop from 10% to 2%. And again, IgG3 switching is normal because the design. Uh, I want to point it out that the generation of plasma cells is also normal, as shown by the plasma cell marker CD138, also named the silicon. Um, what about IgE? IgE is a special class because induction of IgE switching is actually uh, share the same stimuli with IgG1, namely CD40 ligand plus R4. Uh, why is this? That, that's because the germline transcription in the S epsilon locus can also be induced by this same stimuli. So you can imagine one of the B cells receives a CD40 ligand plus R4, it has three choices. It uh, switched to IgG1 only, or IgE only, or from IgG1, then IgE. But no matter what, in, in the knockout B cells, REP7 will not be there. And this will actually lead to reduced IgE switching as well, as shown by CFSC here. And this is in vitro, and in vivo is the same. We can see the similarly reduced over specific antibodies in immunized mice. So we have uh, genetic data or pharmacological uh, data to show this pathway uh, most likely exists. So can we really visualize the, uh, this structure? We do have some preliminary data to show that uh, in CD40 ligand uh, induced B cells, you can see very nice formation of REP7. And uh, by our, our calculation, this foci, their size ranges from 0.5 to 1 micron. This is about the same size as uh, later mature endosomes. 
So it gives us the confidence that uh, this foci may really represent a uh, uh, high molecular weight complex uh, around endosomes. By contrast, lysosome associated membrane protein 1 or LC3, which is a marker for autophagosomes, they show very diffused patterns. They don't form this kind of foci. And when we stand a cell with CD40 specific antibody, we can actually see CD40 also is located in this high dense area and it co localizes with the RAP7 focus, suggesting that uh, there is co localization of endocytosed uh, receptor and the RAP7. Then, how about RAP6? Does RAP7 intact with RAP6? Because the whole uh, model depends on this. In order to address this, we adapted this bifluorescence complementation assay. In this assay, we split the YP into two halves. Uh, each half conjugated to a different molecule. If these two molecules intact, they will bring these two halves together, thereby giving off the fluorescence. If they don't, then there will be no fluorescence. What's important is that if two molecules intact through a third pattern, then these two moieties will not be close enough to fluoresce. So this is a way to really visualize close interactions of the two proteins. And by using this assay, we can show that uh, RAP7 specifically intact with the ring domain of TRAP6, but not the zinc finger or C terminal domain. And the ring domain actually does not intact with AIB or ONC which is another protein essential for CSR. This is our controls. So now you can imagine for TRAF, TRAF6, the N terminal domain binds to RAP7 on the membrane, and the C domain binds to CD40, essentially form these mushroom-like structures, forming a high molecular weight complex. And actually, we can do docking with uh, Dr. Bauda and uh, Jonathan Bohm at the Southwest and they show the ring domain of TRAP6 nicely docked onto RAP7. So all this led us to uh, uh, think that the intracellular membrane structures overall might be important for all sorts of these functions. I just picked up the, this journal this morning and I saw this picture, and I think we have a similar rendition as well. May, may not be as nice as a bacterial art, but still, uh, in this uh, model, what we propose is that uh, mature later endosomes, where you can find the RAP7, is actually important for m B activation, and uh, for not only this activation, but also CSR and SHM. And the lysosomes through mTOR may be important for this as well. Autophagosomes through ATG and ATG5 and ATG7 are important for plasma cell differentiation and all functions, and the memory visa uh, maintenance, respectively. So all these um, uh, are sort of working towards the same theme, that is, different intracellular membrane compartments, they uh, preferentially transduce one or two specific signals while, while fending off noise, and this is how we think the specificity of the B-cell differentiation uh, comes from. So, um, is there any questions so far before I proceed to... Yes? Can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, so then, does all the cl uh, class switching uh, have to proceed through that? Is that, is that what you're saying? Um, as you know, uh, I think our inducible rep server knockout approach is good, but uh, it certainly has its own caveat. Namely, you need 48 hours to knock out rep server, right? Uh, ideally, you should have the rep server knockout from the beginning. Then you can truly assess the contribution of rep server to the whole CSR process. Um, unfortunately, let's, uh, we cannot do this because uh, what we are afraid is that if we delete the RAP7 from the B-cell lineage, 
in, in a bone marrow, B cells will not develop normally. Right? So we can never address that question. So uh, I did not talk about this, but it seems like uh, in different stimuli induced CSR, the reduction varies, uh, ranging from 50% to 70%. So the residual 30% could be due to two reasons, right? One is the compensation. The other one is an incomplete rep 7 deletion. Later on, I will present some uh, small molecule inhibitor of rep 7 But still, what we see, typically, is a 50% reduction with class switch. But again, that could be due to uh, the potency of the but, compounds. But forgive me, um, they are almost as new to me. Um, I'm just trying to. Uh, pick up what I count the slides. So mm -hmm. the way that you guys set up your uh, pre combination, yeah. it was only going to be active, activated by receiving 40. The same stimuli, yeah, all right. That, that, was the, that was only going to act on, on the S element in front of the G, uh, G class. Is that right? Or it's R4. Uh, CD40 ligand, we, what we call it, is a primary stimuli. It's important for switching to all the IG isotypes. It is a cytokine IL-4 that specifies the germline transcription in the gamma-1 locus. Yeah. Right. Okay, but, so it's only going to activate that locus. Right. It's not going to, uh, and so all of the other uh, heavy chains Remain closed. That, that could be activated. Are they, do they still require yeah. cells? Yeah, that's exactly why we did that uh, wash away experiment, right? We first uh, carried, uh, knock out RAP7, then we got rid of CD40 ligand and R4. Then we stimulate with TJ beta yeah. to induce switching to IgA. Then, if because AID is essential for switching to all the IgA isotypes, yeah. when AID expression is reduced, then IgA switching is also reduced. Despite despite the fact that uh, R4 is not there anymore, now it's TJ beta. Okay, um, you know, what's the relevance of our study uh, of rep 7 media and kappa b activation, the AID induction? And the, certainly, this has uh, implications in autoimmune diseases, which I'll present a few slides. Uh, f uh, I don't have the time today to show uh, our work on B cell lymphomogenesis, but we do uh, have a hypothesis that uh, in B lymphoma cells, uh, there may be too much rep 7 activity, not the expression per se, but the, the, it is the activity. And this has to be coupled with an oncogenic hit um, produced by either make or BCL6 or expression. And uh, last year, I remember when Paul and I we were discussing this, right? We were asking, have you ever thought about the aging? I said, of course, aging is important, right? And Apollo said, you know what, probably you don't know. I was the first one to actually show in humans, B cells, are, uh, Asian B cells are more oligoclonal. And uh, I'll talk about some Asian studies as well. Uh, but before that, let's talk about autoimmunity. Uh, in a uh, systemic lupus uh, patient, uh, we can see high expression of REP7 and the AICDA. And actually, this is uh, what we know already. Uh, through the work of Dr. Zen um, more than six years ago now, right? Yeah. And uh, now we show REP7 is also uh, upregulated. And in uh, lupus mouse models, LPR and SLE123, these are two different mouse models. We can also see that uh, both REP7 and AICDA are upregulated. And this is not because uh, these mice have more activated B cells. Because we can sort germinals and the B cells from each of the, these mouse strands, from all type C57 mice or uh, MIO mice, and compare apples to apples, uh, their REP7 AICDA expression level, and they're still higher in lupus, suggesting that uh, uh, these lupus B cells have intrinsic uh, regulation or hardwired to express more REP7 AID. So what, what can we do about it? And um, 
Then this small molecule come from CID106770 that has been identified uh, through high throughput screening of uh, 250,000 uh, library to be the only one that uh, that can bind Rep7. And uh, the binding of Rep7 actually is uh, much more potent than to several other off targets like a CDC42 or Rep2 or uh, Rep line. And uh, consider this as a Rep7 specific inhibitor. When we apply CID106770 to uh, stimulate the B cells, we can actually see that the activation of Rep7, as is shown by this uh, RILP GSD pull-down assay, to be reduced. RILP is a Rep7 effector. It only binds to the active form of Rep7, which is a GTP bond form. And uh, this small molecule inhibitor also reduced, just like a Rep7 knockout, the ID expression and the class region. And what's important is that uh, when we apply the small molecule on Rep7 knockout B cells, we don't see further decrease of class region. So as you recall, the knockout B cells, again, this is another uh, example to answer Shen's question. There's about 50% reduction, right? And by applying CID here, you don't see further reduction, suggesting that all the impact of small molecule uh, has to go through Rep7. In a way, indirect is showing the target of uh, this small molecule in B cells is Rep7. And the, then we can also treat normal C57 mice immunized with uh, MPCGG with this compound and the show reduced uh, class switch to antibody response. Then with all these, then we are confident that uh, uh, enough to treat uh, lupus mice, MRO mice, with uh, the compound. So we only did a 10-week treatment with, uh, with one injection each week. Without treatment, the mice died quickly uh, with a half-life of about 22 weeks. But with treatment, the half-life extended more than 52 weeks. And we believe that uh, if we continue the treatment, then the lifespan of the mice will be even longer. And again, uh, being the loops model, this MRO mice showing skin lesions as well as skin nephritis. But upon treatment, these symptoms have been vastly improved. And the improvement has been associated with a much reduced immunocomplex deposition in the kidney as well as the autonuclear autoantibody levels in the serum. We also analyzed the double-strand DNA uh, autoantibodies and shown that the treatment also belonged to this response. So to summarize the first part of the talk, what we showed is uh, Rep7 is important for class switching, and it does so by activating MKB b and the induced AID. And uh, the Rep7 inhibitor can actually blocks both antibody and autoantibody response. So we talked about the T-cell dependent response. So the second part of the talk will be mainly about the dual TOR and the BCR engagement. This is a, what we call T-cell independent response. Uh, we did this really initially out of the curiosity of uh, what uh, other receptors on the B cell surface can do, notably TLR12, TLR4, TLR7, 8, and the TLR9. TLR9 is an endosome um, TLRs. So we were naive enough just to treat B cells with uh, TLR, different TLR ligand, and uh, to our surprise, all of them can actually show some uh, class switching inducing activities, although not much, tops at the 8%. And then we think um, a B cell, you know, the TLS does not confer any antigen specificity, right? The antigen specificity is confirmed, conferred by PCR cross linking. And uh, it turns out the PCR cross linking per se doesn't induce any class switching, although limited the numbers of cell divisions. But once you put these two stimuli together, it's just like a, a 
little fire, suddenly you get a 40% switching here and here. This is a much more potent than, it's not as, uh, the same as CD40 induced CSR, if not more potent. And what's interesting is that uh, when you put the B-cell cross-linking in CD40 glycan induced B-cells, CSR doesn't get increased, it gets decreased. So the synergy between BCR cross-linking and the TLR is general and specific. And the one special case is LPS. As you can see, LPS alone as a general TLR4 ligand in microphages, uh, it doesn't need a BCR cross-linking, although adding BCR cross-linking further increases CSR to almost 70%. So uh, then what's so special about the LPS? It just turns out that uh, it has two moieties. One is TR4 engaging lipid A moiety. The other one is the polysaccharide moiety, which we believe can engage BCR in a relatively non-specific manner of uh, primary B cell repertoire. We can actually use chasm flux assays to show that uh, uh, this is indeed the case. Each color line represents a cell that shows chasm flux. When B cells is stimulated by LPS, you can see 30% of the B cells show this uh, activity, while EPA, that's nothing. And the B cell cross uh, reagent as a control, you know, induced chasm flux in almost 100% of the cells. Uh, the next, what we address is uh, the role of PI3K in the B cell signaling. And it turns out in the knockout mice, you have much reduced glass switching in dual engagement the BCR TR induced CSR, but not in CD40 ligand induced CSR. If anything, there's an increase. Uh, I'm not going to uh, make this boring to go through all the panels, but uh, uh, what the conclusion we have is that uh, BCR cross-linking through PI3K activates m kappa b through the non-canonical pathway. Total-lac receptor through MyD88 and the TRIF activate uh, m kappa through canonical m kappa pathway. You need both for optimal induction of AID as well as 1433. And the CD40 itself is very interesting because you can activate the canonical m kappa pathway through TRIF6 and the non-canonical m kappa pathway through TRAP2 and the TRAP3. And uh, so this, this signal per se can activate both, but this you need a dual engagement. And this just to give you an example why both are important. When we use chip, and, chip assays to analyze P65 binding uh, uh, in 14 3 3 gamma locus, we can see uh, the strong binding in the promoter region and in one of the enhancers. And the uh, P52 of the non-canonical m kappa pathway, we can see this binding as well as in other cryptical m kappa side. sites, we, we don't know yet. And when we abolish the canonical pathway through this small molecule, which is an IKK beta inhibitor, and in the meantime abolish the non-canonical pathway using PI3K knockout, we virtually abolish the 14 3 3 gamma induction and the CSR. So after all this, we firmly established that the CSR and the can be induced in a T cell independent manner through DO engagement. Then we move on to important questions to address immunodeficiency in Asian. And this is important, you know, with the I'm not sure whether this is the very first paper, but certainly among the very first papers that uh, uh, serum titers inversely correlated with aging. And uh, through a series of studies, including investigators in our own institution, we now understand that, that there are uh, broad spectrum immunodeficiency in T cells, in B cells, in NK cells. And uh, certainly there are also exceptions that uh, seems like bubbles, they just don't develop age-associated immunodeficiency. So we ask, 
a naive question, how about B cells? How about switched B cells, given, given that the CSI is our research focus? So what I do is uh, we get the blood from normal donors through South Texas Tissue and Blood Center. And we just do simple profiling. And this is already very telling, although the sample size is still small. Uh, for donors who are seven, uh, younger than 18, they have a few B cells in the PBMCs. In adults, uh, you can see this is a normal range. But in 50 dollars, 50 to 58 years old, the B cell numbers actually increase. And whether this is due to the preferential expansion of certain ABC types or oligoclonals, we don't know yet. But certainly, this is the phenotype. But this high number of B cells does not translate into high quality of B cells. Because you can see among these B cells, the class switched cells actually is fewer. Then that raises the issue, right? Are these aging B cells really uh, incapable in switching or what? Or is there other extrinsic fact factors? And um, as I will show you later, it's mostly uh, extrinsic. Uh, possibly due to defective T cell health, right? as Dr. Griffiths and Dr. Craig uh, argue. And uh, we can take naive B cells from the aging donors and uh, stimulate our CD40 line in. And uh, as you can see, they are fully capable in undergo class switching, even more so than the younger donors. And uh, this is the statistics. So this really suggests there's nothing wrong with aging B cells. What is wrong is they don't get enough help in vivo. And this help can come from T cells, can come from uh, dendritic cells, or, or other immune components. So this also seems to suggest that the evolutionary, oh, we also did this for the uh, aging mouse B cells. And again, showing there's almost no defect when we stimulate with CD40 ligand or LPS. So this seems like uh, there's an uh, evolution constraint that uh, specify aging B cells, they should be as potent as uh, it could in order to maintain some sort of immunity. So how do we get advantage of this? Then we use T cell independent. Question, yes. Do you think that because those doses of LPS are pretty high, uh, yeah. Right. Um, they are high uh, in relative to the doses we use for microphages. For microphages, people use one nanogram to one hundred nanogram per microliter LPS because microphages are hardwired to receive <coughs> TR four signaling. But for B cell class switching. Uh, let me see whether this will help us. We did the dose response for LPS, right? From uh, sorry, from a point three one and three. We also did the point one, but even at the point three, the CSI induction is very low, so we cannot really further lower it to appreciate the difference. So this is the intrinsic difference between B cells and the myeloid cells in terms of TR4 signaling. So uh, then we uh, use uh, MP conjugated to LPS as a T cell independent antigen. Keep in mind, uh, LPS here functions merely as a TR4 uh, engaging moiety. Its polysaccharidic moiety may have no uh, implications in the response. Uh, what cross links BCI is the MP moiety. And we can actually show uh, IgM and IgG2B response in uh, two cohorts are virtually the same, with IgG1 actually better in uh, aging mice. In IgG3, uh, young mice seems to compete better. And this is a, a secondary response after boosting with the lower dose of MPLPS. 
So this suggests that uh, in young mice, NPLPS can induce both primary and amnestic response. And, and in aging mice, the same thing also happens despite some uh, isotype differences. So finally, I would like to uh, thank people who did the work. Uh, and I should also thank Dr. Pisali for uh, his, uh, we, are, we are long time collaborators and uh, we really enjoy working together. And uh, Dr. Zhang as well. And uh, these are people in the lab and uh, these are from the including a um, pilot award from the San Antonio Nathan Shock Center. So I'll stop here and uh, sorry for taking a long time. <laughs>